So God, now as we open your word, I pray that you speak to us. God, you have, you have planned, you have prepared to meet us and to encounter us through your word and through these songs and through Jordan's testimony this morning way, way before today. And so I pray that you would be faithful to deliver the message that you have for your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Take your Bibles out. Take your smart device, your dumb device, whatever you've got uh, with you today. And I want you to turn to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations, that's going to be between Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Um, But Lamentations chapter 3, and I'll explain to you uh, why we're going to turn to Lamentations this morning uh, in just a few moments to talk about hope. uh, Because a lot of Lamentations, there's not much hope. There's not much hope. Um, but uh, I was reading a couple weeks ago uh, in my Bible plan for the year, and uh, just I was, I was sitting in Lamentations chapter 3, and there's so much hope towards the end of this chapter. And I just thought to myself, this is what our folks need to hear. This is what our folks need to hear. Because so many of us, so many of us are stuck in a place of hopelessness. We just talked about that relationally for three weeks. That so many of us are stuck in a place of loneliness, stuck in a place of hopelessness, where we can't even see the glimmer of hope, and where we kind of got to work, each other, work ourselves up and work each other up to, even, to, 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 to look to hope. But that, as, as I was saying earlier, is what Advent's all about. You know, it's the runway. It's the, it's the descent to Jesus coming. December 25th, we'll celebrate Jesus coming. I got to have a conversation with a couple of our kiddos this morning who are greatly anticipating that morning and hopeful for some things that are going to come into their living room. A giant stuffed pig, a giant stuffed goat, some perler beads or parlor beads, whatever those are. And then, and then I, think, I think one of them left it actually here for me. And then, and then some, some string, this is not yarn, I was corrected this morning, but some string to make more bracelets like this. And that's, that's what they're hoping for. And so they're going to spend the next three or four weeks in hope that those things are going to show up, right? And we hope for those things. Uh, uh, um, I was I was talking to some 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 other folks that that uh, that that this morning that hoped uh, a week or two ago that they would get the two billion dollars in the lottery. I'm confident that their motivation for hoping for that was so that they could build the church debt free. Okay, wow. All right, uh, we know what kind of crowd we got in here. Okay. <laughs> Oh, move on. Okay, um, but, but we all hope for things, right? We all hope for things. We hope that uh, when we go on that vacation, right, that we get to do certain things, right? We hope when we, when, when we have that time off that we can get through the list of things that we have. We hope, we hope for certain things. And the reality is that each and every one of us have hope. But you know, the thing about hope that you learn as you get a little bit older, right, is that hope is risky. Look at your neighbor and say, hope's risky. Look back at your neighbor and say, why is hope risky? Well, I'm glad you asked the question. Hope is risky because it kind of makes yourself vulnerable, doesn't it? It sets you up for what could be failure. Right? I hope I make this shot. But I could miss that shot, right? I hope that I get this promotion. And then what happens if you don't get the promotion, right? I hope that this surgery heals me. I hope that this takes the cancer away. I hope that this blank, right? You insert it. You insert it. And when we hope for things, we put ourselves out there for disappointment. For let down. And the idea for the church celebrating Advent every year and starting it out with hope is that because we know the end of the story, our hope is not centered in a circumstance. Our hope is not centered in a check. Our hope is not centered in a person 
this side of heaven that will no doubt let us down because how many of us know every person will let us down if we spend enough time with them? Amen? Because they're not perfect. But our hope isn't centered in those things. We celebrate the birth of a baby Jesus who is the assurance of hope. Who will never let us down, even when it seems like it. Who will never disappoint us. Who knows what's better for us than we do. And that's the hope that we celebrate. Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. And uh, it, was, it was in Jeremiah 3. But he's, well, he's, he's known as the, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. The weeping prophet. Okay, we had a weeping prophet up here a few moments ago praying over Jordan, right? Russ cries often. It's okay. Sorry, Russ. That's probably probably TMI, right? But Jeremiah is known as a weeping prophet in great despair who God uses to write his emotions, to put his emotions down. And he lived among a society of people who caused him to, to lose hope constantly, right? You ever look around and just lose hope? Right? You ever look around at the people you're with and just, just think, wow, this is where we are. Right? Okay. That's where Jeremiah was. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 9, uh, uh, God tells Jeremiah that he's among a people who knew not the Lord. Right? They didn't, they didn't understand the Lord. They didn't understand God. Right? And so we look into Lamentations chapter 3, and I just want to read uh, the first few verses to you this morning. And, and they'll be on the screen. Follow along with me, if you will. Let's read the first eight verses. I am the man who has seen affliction. Under the rod of his wrath, he has driven me and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walked me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, He shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear, verse 10, lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me into pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He keeps going. I've forgotten what happiness is, he says in verse 17. So so I say my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. My endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. The hope that he speaks is is beyond hopelessness, right? I mean, we we see broken bones. We see, uh, uh, you know, blocked my ways with blocks of stones, made my paths crooked. This This is about the darkest hopelessness that we could be in, right? And as, I, and as I mentioned to you before, I feel like many, some of us, and, 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 and many of us at least know someone in this place that is stuck in this place of hopelessness. Total darkness and can't see the light. Psalm 42.5 puts it this way, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you at turmoil within me? But then the psalmist goes on to say, hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. Psalm 71.5, for you are my hope, O God. And so we see that even though there's hopelessness, if we look on, verse 20, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. So in the midst of hopelessness, verse 19, remember my afflictions, my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. 
This is, this is what we call a but God moment. Right? A but God moment. Everything looked despair. Everything was hopeless. But God. And this is where we have to get to in our hopelessness. Right, family? This is where we've got to get to. Is that when things are dark and we can't even see the light. But God. So let's read about it. Verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Verse 31, for the Lord will not cast off forever. Though the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. And that's where I want to stop this morning. Because many, many of us know the hope of the Lord and get stuck in hopelessness. And I want us to look at what Jeremiah does here in flipping the script, because everything in the hopelessness are the lies that the enemy wants us to believe about our life. You're hopeless. You're, da- you're too damaged for God to use you. You're too broken. You don't know enough. You've messed up too many times. You don't associate with the right group of people. You don't this. You don't that. And if we begin to focus on all of the ways that we don't measure up, that's pretty hopeless, isn't it? But then we come to the truth. But God made a way for you to be His beloved. But God made a way for you to spend eternity. And there's the hope. And so as we think about hope, I want to point out four things to you from this passage, okay? Verse 24. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Jesus brings a hope that produces life. Jesus brings a hope that produces life. That because of Christ, I can hope in life. In fact, John 20, verse 21 says this, These things I've written, uh, many more signs and wonders were done that were written in this book, but these I've written that you may have life. Jesus went to the cross. We have the scriptures so that we can affirm and confirm that we have a hope that produces life. First Peter chapter 1 says this, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Verse 4, to an inheritance that's imperishable, it doesn't go away, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed to you. There's hope. There's hope. The second thing we see here from verse 26, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. How good are we at waiting quietly? Anybody in here have the gift of patience that could, that could just give us a lesson on patience? Right? That's the one thing you don't pray for, right? That if you pray for God to give you patience, what's He going to do? He's going to give you opportunities to be patient, which is just dumb, isn't it? <laughs> so we don't pray for that. Especially don't pray for that for your pastor. Please. <laughs> I want what I want, and I want it now. Right? We see a hope that flourishes. The hope that we have in God is a visible hope by faith that presents a clear picture for our lives. Paul puts it this way to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? I don't have to hope for the last piece of pecan pie if it's right there in front of me. Because I've got it. 
right? I've got it. I don't have to hope for things that are right in front of me, right? We don't have to hope for things that we see. We hope for things that are unseen. That's what Paul is telling the church in Rome. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it, here it is again, with patience. And when it comes to patience, I love how Paul follows this up, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For when it comes to hope, we do, not what to pray, we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. Hebrews 11, for the faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. So this hope is flourishing. It grows. It gets bigger. Number three, we see a hope that cleanses us. A hope that purifies us. If you look at 1 John chapter 3 and just write these references down, John says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Verse 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. One may wonder how to stay pure from the influence of society, right? Jeremiah was able to live for God despite living among a godless group of people. Why? Because he had hope. And his hope sustained him. That's why we talk about around here all the time that hope is the, is the thing that separates Christianity from any other religion. Because the hope that Jesus is coming again, the hope that we're going to spend eternity in heaven is the thing that sustains us, that keeps us pure, that keeps us cleansed. He had hope in his God. And then number four, a hope that fills our lives. And so if Jeremiah was just, was just spending his time reflecting on the beginning of that passage, that's pretty hopeless, right? That's pretty hopeless. And if we, if we spend all of our time reflecting and focusing on the circumstances that are right in front of us, that's pretty hopeless, isn't it? At times, right? I, if, 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 if we just focus on those things, it's pretty, it's pretty hopeless. But God... And so the thing that we can't do as Christians is we can't spend all of our time believing the lies. We've got to replace the lies with the truth. And that's how we get a hope that fills our lives. Hebrews chapter 6 puts it this way. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you've shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. To have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hopelessness is paralyzing, isn't it? Hopefulness is flourishing. It's exciting. And sometimes you've got to flip the script a little bit to bring that hopelessness to reality, amen? <coughs> Excuse me. I need some pecan pie to wet that throat. And the writer of Hebrews goes on in, in, in verse 19 of chapter 6. And this was a theme verse that I spoke on quite a bit this past summer. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. The writer of Hebrews refers to the hope as an anchor for the soul. Something to keep it stable. Something to keep it solid. Something to keep it in place. An anchor for the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. That is the hope of Advent. That we could live a life that flourishes. That we could live a life that fills our lives, that cleanses us, and that produces life. So, for the rest of our time, what, about 90 more minutes? I want to think about what hope is about. Because 
I think, I think it's a concept that, that as we're all sitting here, yeah, you know what? I should be more hopeful. I should be more hopeful. I want to tell you four things about hope that are just really practical. Is that all right? Good, because I've got the microphone, so you didn't really have a choice. Okay? The first is this. Hope is about a promise. That's Advent. Right? Hope is about a promise. What's the promise? That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How did Christ get here? That he was born of a virgin Mary. Right? And that's what we're going to celebrate for the next month together. And we're going to sing about it. We're going to sing, Hark! The herald angels sing, right? Which it always bugs me with that song. Okay, can I explain to you how that, why that bugs me? Let's just get real practical for just a moment. I need to confess something to you. Okay, because it's hark. It's a declaration, then exclamation mark, then the angel. It's a, you know, it's a thing, but we just sing it as a run-on sentence. But it's really meant to be hark! The herald angels sing. Right? And so next time we sing that, can we sing that again next week, Dylan? And let's just sing, we're going to sing it. Hark! The herald, right? Okay, we're, we're going we're gonna to change that up for just a minute, right? So, so hope is about a promise that we remind ourselves of often. The concept of preaching the gospel to yourself every day. Now, if you're kind of new around church, gospel is a term that we Christians like to use, okay? That's a little fancy, and some of you may be sitting and thinking, what in the world is this word? Gospel is a word that simply means the good news of Jesus. Well, why not just say that? I don't know. I agree with you. Okay, it just makes things complicated, right? And if you're new to church and, and you come and you hear the word gospel, it's like, whoo-hoo, I don't know what that means, right? It's just the good news of Jesus, that Jesus came to pay a debt that you could not pay, to die a death that you would not want to die, and to raise again so that he could go and prepare a place for you, as he promises in John 14 and 15, that where he is, you might be also to spend eternity with him in paradise around a feast, around a table. And so gospel summarizes that entire narrative of Jesus. The narrative from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation. That He is good. That He is for you. That He desires a relationship with you. And He's gone through great lengths of giving His only Son so that He could have communion with you. Life with you. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty overwhelming truth, isn't it? It's overwhelming enough to overwhelm every lie that the enemy wants you to believe. It's overwhelming enough that if we preach that to ourselves moment by moment every day, that I might not be enough for this boss, but I'm enough for my Savior. I might not be enough for this, this person in my life that just constantly rips me apart, tears me down, and, and, and always consumes from me, but never gives but I'm enough for Jesus. That Jesus knew everything He was purchasing. This is the one that just really gets me, family. This is the one that just really gets me. Okay? I'm probably out of the camera, so if, if you're online and watching, I'll be back in just a minute. <laughs> but just hear my voice. This is the one that really gets me. That Jesus on the cross purchased me with his blood and knew exactly what he was getting and didn't have any, any type of L.L. Bean return policy. <laughs> there was no return policy. He knew it. He knew the entirety. Why? Because He created you. He created you. He knows you. He knows your ins and outs. He knows your deepest doubts and your darkest fears. He knows it all. And yet He still wanted you. He still purchased you. All sales final. No regrets. Why? That sounds crazy, Pastor, that, 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 that he would do that. I know! 
That's grace. It's crazy. And that's why some people call it a crazy love, that he would go through that much so that he could just spend eternity with you forever. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but when I think about hope being about a promise, that's a promise that I can preach and repeat and recite over all of the lies that try to creep into my head. Come on now. We can't get so stuck in our hopelessness that we forget to repeat the promise. Second thing I want to tell you about hope is that hope is about a person. Now, I know this is a little repetitive, okay? Hope is about a person. Who's the person? Jesus. Good, good job, good job, good job. Good job. Proud of you. Hope is about a person. That person is Jesus. The vision for a better future, the vision for a better present isn't based on our wishful thinking or even faith in that future. Instead, the promise points to a specific person. Hope isn't wrapped in a season. Hope isn't wrapped in a program. Hope isn't wrapped in a new job. Hope isn't wrapped in a, in a better spouse or a bigger house or no snow. It's coming. Hope is wrapped in a person. And here's, here's the beautiful part. There's, 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 there's a name for, for that hope, and it's called Messiah. The biblical word for this person is Messiah, a, a, a person of hope, a bringer of hope. Third thing about hope, I don't want to tell you, is hope changes us in the, in the present. It changes us in the present. You know that person that is just so joyful all the time, they drive you absolutely crazy? Chances are they're just full of hope. And the reason they drive us so crazy is because we're not walking in that hope. Have you ever, have you ever, have you ever sat there and just, just thought to yourself, oh, if I only had a little bit of what they were on, Right? Well, you can have it. Because it's Jesus. And when we're hoping in Jesus, it changes us in the present. It's noticeable, fam. It is noticeable, fam, when I'm walking in hope and when I'm walking in Travis. I'm assuming those moans were like, yep, it is very noticeable, Travis. And we need you to walk in hope a little bit more. Right? Right? I see it. I feel it. Right? When we're, when we're walking in hope, we're a different person. We're a lighter person. We're a more joyful person. But when the things of the first part of Lamentations, the, the dark room where we don't see any light at the end of the tunnel, right? When we're walking in that, it's pretty doom and gloom. It's pretty doom and gloom. So hope changes us in the present. And then lastly, and we already talked about this, so I'm going to breeze through it. Hope brings risk. Hope brings risk. Again, because when we hope for something, we make ourselves a little vulnerable, don't we? We make ourselves a little vulnerable. And sometimes, not even a little vulnerable, we make ourselves a lot vulnerable. And we set ourselves up for disappointment. Now, let's just make this super practical. If you're sitting here this morning, and you're thinking to yourself, Man, you know what I would love? I hope one day for the perfect pastor. <laughs> Keep searching. Right? I hope one day for the perfect church. Don't stay here, because you'll ruin us. <laughs> right? The perfect church is the one that has nobody in it. And I spent far too long living a lie, a lie, everybody say lie. lie, living a lie that thinking I had to be put together, I had to be perfect, I couldn't have any brokenness, I couldn't be me. 
Because if people really knew me, if people really got to know Travis, then they wouldn't want to be around me. They certainly wouldn't come to church on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. to listen to me talk. They certainly wouldn't want to do that. They certainly wouldn't want to come into my office and, and confide and, 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 and search for, for truth and encouragement and blessing. They certainly wouldn't want to do that. And so I, I thought for a long time that I had to be something I wasn't so that I could be accepted by a group of people. And can I tell you, that doesn't lead to hope. That leads to exhaustion. It leads to burnout. It leads to such disappointment because you never reach that level of acceptance. Why? Because see, people see through it. See, I know, I, know, I know one thing for sure about each and every one of us in this room. Each and every one of us. Whether you believe this and you've come to realize this or not, I know something that's consistent with each and every one of us this morning. You ready for it? Each and every one of us is broken and needs a Savior. Each and every one of us. And so if we already know that about ourselves, how about we put aside the pretending and we just embrace our brokenness and say, you know what? Hi, my name's Travis. And I'm broken. But I hope you'll love me anyway. That's hope. An acknowledgement of who we are in relation to who God is and hoping for a future. The, 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 the assurance of things hoped for. That's faith. So, how do we get there? How do we get there? Three short things. God gave me these uh, last night, so they're not going to be on your screen. So you'll just have to write them down, take notes, something like that, take a picture. Uh, no, they're not going to be on the screen, so you can't take a picture, right? Okay. So how do we get there? Number one, how do, how do we live our life of hope? Number one, we've got to remember. Look at, what, look at what Jeremiah does in verse 31. We've got to remember, for the Lord will not cast off forever. So even if we're going through a dark time, even if we're going through a dry time, even if we're going through a lonely time, even if we're going through whatever time that's bring, bringing us to a despair moment, we've got to remember. Go back to the moment that you met God. Go back to the moment where God felt as real as He's ever felt for you. Go back to the moment, uh, uh, if, if you're in ministry, Jordan and, and Russ and, and, and others that are, that are in the room that are in ministry, Pastor Rick will get this, uh, go back to the moment when he called you. Go back to the moment when he called you. Remember, remember the realness of God in that moment. Remember how tangible and thick he felt. Remember that situation where everything around didn't make sense, it didn't add up, and yet it happened. That's God. That's God. I love those phone calls every week. Or those emails that I get every week. Pastor, you're just not going to believe this. Or folks that, that aren't even in the church. Travis, you're not going to believe this. This was happening, this was happening, and then just out of the blue, I have no idea where it came from, this happened. And I'm like, huh, I know where it came from. I don't always tell them that, right? We know where it comes from. That's God moving and working in your life. And so the first place, the first step to getting back to a place of hope is to remember, to go back to the moment when he called you, to go back to the moment where he made himself real to you, to go back to the moment where you felt the most hopeful ever in your life. Number two. And this, this, is, this is where we lose a lot of people. This is where we lose a lot of people. Not only do we have to remember, but we've got to surrender. We've got to surrender. Because what does it mean to surrender? It means to let go. Right? Look at verse 32. But though he caused grief, he will have compassion 
according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Though he caused grief, just because you're hopeful does not mean you're going to go through a, not going to go through a hard time. And I was just reading this morning in 1 Peter where we're promised hard time, we're promised struggle. But though he caused grief, he will have compassion. And in that, we are called to surrender. We are called to put the weapons down. We are called to shut our mouths. We are called to take a seat. Because He is in control. And He who promised and He who called you is faithful. And so even when it doesn't make sense, and even when we feel like, you know, there, there are many times where, 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 I, where I just sit and pray, God, if you would just come and move. If you would just come and do something. And he's just like, just wait. Just wait. Just wait. You can imagine how that goes over for a guy that struggles with patience. Just wait. Which leads me to number three. In order to remember and in order to surrender, if we're going to live a life of hope, we've got to trust Him. To surrender, it takes trust, doesn't it? I think I told you all recently, we were... Um, we, we, there was a holiday recently. I'm not talking about Thanksgiving. Uh, and, and more of a, more of one of those sad holidays, right, that comes every year in Gorham, the last day that Beals is open. It's a day of mourning and grieving, severe loss. And uh, if, if you're visiting from out of state, Beals is a, is a local ice cream spot. That if your family hasn't taken you to when you visited in the summer, you need a better family. <laughs> but uh, they, they homemade ice cream. There's, there's a couple places that are year-round, so have them take you before you leave town, okay? But Beal, but we were, so Beals was closing for the winter, which, which again, doesn't make sense, because you need ice cream all year long, <laughs> Amen. I digress. <laughs> but we were there, and, uh, and, and we, were, um, we were waiting to order our ice cream. And, and if you've ever hung out with us, um, or if you don't know us very well, right, we have four kids. And, um, and, and at least a couple of those kids at a time, it's never consistent. One of them's always consistent. Um, but, but, but the other one uh, varies from time to time. But at least two of them are always high energy. High energy. And struggle, like their dad, to stand still and just wait for things. Okay? And so a couple, a couple of the kids were standing in line. And a couple of the kids decided it would be a good idea while they're standing in line to practice the trust fall. And so, and so one of the kids tur turned their back and said, okay, we're going to do a trust fall. And then like said, three, two, one, and just fell. And I'm like, oh, like that slow motion moment where you try to like go in and catch. And before I knew it, there were two kids right there to catch them. Right? It was unbelievable. But I thought to myself, the trust that that kid just had in their siblings who they have terrorized for the last month of their life, right? Or hours. They've been at each other constantly, at each other, at each other, at each other. And now all of a the sudden, they're just saying, trust fall, three, two, one, and then falling. Right? Like, let's do that right now. Trust fall, three, two. <laughs> you had one chance. <laughs> one opportunity you got to seize the moment. 
I wouldn't, I would break her. <laughs> How'd you break your neck? Well, I was at church. <laughs> and my pastor decided to practice the trust fall. Isn't that crazy? See, 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 many of us up here, you, you know who trust isn't hard for? The people that are learning about God down in the cafeteria. That's why scripture talks all the time about having faith like a child. Because you're still hopeful. You're not tainted by the times that you've done a trust fall and just fallen flat on your back. And it's hard to trust. And even the times that I've trusted God for something, and it's come out looking differently, it's so good. It's so good. I mean, the most tangible thing that I can think about with this right now is that building going up on 26 Cressy Road. A lot of you know the story. When Dylan and I started uh, meeting with Great Falls and designing this thing and our elders and, 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 and other leaders that were involved in this thing, that thing was about three times the size it is now and, 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 and you know, do- doors on every wall in the kitchen, um, you know, uh, uh, all, all kinds of things, right? My office was going to be two stories with a loft and a spiral staircase and a <laughs> and a fireman pole to be able to just slide down on Sunday mornings as I can, right? Like, I mean, I mean, that thing was designed, it looked a lot differently. And as we prayed in, in 2019 and, and, and the first part of 2020 and even into the summer of 2020, God, have your way. You know the desires of our heart. You know what we want to do with this thing. You know what we're hoping for in this thing. But we trust you. It doesn't look the same way it looked a few years ago. But I walked through there, and I was walking through there Thursday night, and it, I, I, just, I just can't wait to see what God's going to do. And what He's given us now is way better. Because there are people that are already moaning about mopping the floor in the sanctuary. Can you imagine if that sanctuary was twice as big? (laughs) And so God's going to ease us. Ease us into what He's got. And I say this often, and hopefully after today you'll understand why I say it as often as I do. But I believe that if you're in this room and you trust Christ, Trust Jesus. The best is yet to come. Because what's the best? Eternity. And so no matter what it feels like, this side of heaven, no matter what party cleaned up in the election, every time there's an election, which I think we just had one, no matter what teams win, no matter what relationship is hurting, no matter what the bank account looks like, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And so my prayer for you this morning, if you're feeling a little hopeless, the worship team is going to come, is that you would remember the moment where, that you felt closest to God, and that you would surrender your desires, that you would surrender the boxing gloves, that you would surrender, that you'd hit your knees and just say, you know what, God, not my will. Yours be done. And then that you would trust Him with the outcome. And if we would do that, if we would be willing to risk in that, I believe you would see the best is yet to come. And I believe that you would wake up tomorrow morning with a little more hope.
than you did this morning. So let's remember who God is. Preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Surrender to his will and trust him with the outcome. Sound good? Easy enough, right? Let's pray. God, I'm thankful that we can sit here this morning, that I can stand here this morning, and that I can share the testimony of your goodness to us. That's what this is all about. God, that you're good. And God, we need you. More today than yesterday, we'll need you more tomorrow than we need you in this moment. And so God, I just pray for surrender in this room. God, that if someone's in a conflict and, and, and they're just sure that they're right, God, that you would give them a softness. Remind us of what that means for eternity. And more importantly, what it doesn't mean. And that we would heed the scripture where it says, do your best to live at peace with everyone. Because the days are short. And so God, remind us of who we are and who you are and our need for you. And I pray that today, as a result of being here, being together, that we, we would leave a little more hopeful because of our trust in you and because of our remembrance of who you are and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.